You know, a lot of families have treasures, and they're not really treasures at all. And here in my study at home, there's this walking cane. Pretty unremarkable. There's a label here, though, that says, 1933, a century of progress, Chicago. My granddad was a brakeman on the IC Railroad. That's where I got the Grady from. He was a Grady. He died before I was born. But running up and down the railroad and going back and forth to Chicago a lot of the time, here's a souvenir cane. What is it worth? Make an offer. It's really not worth anything. And a lot of family treasures and heirlooms, pots and pans and plates and souvenir spoons, and everybody has seen the joke t-shirt. My Nana went to New York City and all she brought back was this stinking t-shirt. Well, I look at this every now and then and you know it's something of a symbol, even a relic, of a day gone by. Once upon a time, not so much today, but the World's Fair. That was a big event indeed. Now that's the promotional poster on the right, the 1933 World's Fair in Chicago that my granddad went to and millions of others made their way to Chicago for that world exposition. But it's the poster on the left there that we're going to talk about for just a few minutes, the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago celebrating the 400th year anniversary of Columbus and his discovery of the new year, and even making mention of that kind of reminds us that the world has gone on, and a lot of people today have a problem celebrating anything about Columbus, but not so much in the long ago past. And from time to time, the World's Fair. The nations of the world came together to show off, to demonstrate. Sometimes there was a point to be proved by the host nation and a bit of propaganda that they wanted to put out, sometimes in a good way. In 1893, Chicago wanted a grand stage to demonstrate that Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicking over the lantern and burning the city down, well, Chicago was back in 1915. San Francisco hosted a World's Fair to demonstrate that the great earthquake a few years earlier had not robbed that city of its greatness and of its spirit. Many of the World's Fairs they're important and still remembered somewhat by us today. Have you seen the Eiffel Tower in Paris? Built for the 1889 World's Fair. Have you seen the movie Meet Me in St. Louis? Judy Garland and others. The 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. Have you seen the Space Needle? 1962 Seattle World's Fair, the 1964 World's Fair in New York City, and the last one here in the United States, 1984, there in New Orleans. And maybe some of you have been to these grand extravaganzas. But you know, when we think about the World's Fair, there's been a lot of them. And They've shown off technological advances and cultural novelties. And if a company has a brand new product or something new and exciting or even sensational, once upon a time, the World's Fair would be the stage where that would be unveiled. Not so today, I understand in Vegas. There's an annual consumer's electronic show that's supposed to be out of this world. 
Well, the world has moved on, and maybe the world's fair not so much in our mind and in our thoughts today. But you know, during the time, it was a wonder. Not just for the millions of people who would attend, but sometimes for the historical and cultural significance. And no more so, I think, than the architecture. In 1893, more than 200 buildings were constructed. They designed, were designed to be temporary. A section of the shoreline of the lake was cleared and drained. And then these buildings began to pop up around a reflecting pool basin. And most of them are gone today because uh, they weren't built to last. And they were all covered with a plaster, cement, some kind of stucco covering, and they all glistened white. In fact, some people think that the author of The Wizard of Oz, he got his idea for the Emerald City seeing the spectacle of all these buildings lit up by electricity in 1893 Chicago. And I'm sure that it's more than just seeing famous people at a big event, more than eating Cracker Jacks for the very first time anywhere, and more than just the lights and the sound and the spectacle, the buildings, impressive, monumental, and, you know, a building can be designed and built to reflect the notion that this is an important place. This is an important company, a bank, an insurance company, or a seat of government. And the White City, built for the 1893 fair, in the end, that awed more people than perhaps riding for the very first time anywhere on a great Ferris wheel. And the building, one of the two or three that still stands, and one of the buildings that was renowned for its amazing beauty and its grace and its dignity was known as the Art Palace. And they're just these old pictures from 1893. Now that's an impressive building, don't you think? And the lines and the sweeping grandeur and the classic architecture and the great dome and then built on the lagoon or the reflecting pool as people would be able to see it from across the water and admire it from some little distance. And the inside of it was pretty remarkable, not a window in the place, but it was all given over to exhibitions, painting, sculpture, pottery, fine works collected from all over the world, and many people left the 1893 fair marveling over the grandeur of the Palace of Fine Arts. And then the years passed. Remember I said that this building had a brick interior, and then it was covered over with that plaster, that temporary cement, that stucco-like quality, I've only spent a day and a couple of nights in Chicago, but as I recall, the wind blew, and it was in July, and it was pleasant enough, hot, but I've been told that the wind in Chicago during the winter is the hawk, and an exterior of a temporary facade on a building begins to give way in a hurry, and as the years passed, the outside of the building began to crumble and peel off and flake off, and before long, that once magnificent building was 
hardly more than an eyesore. And then a remarkable thing happened, I think, and one that serves as the point of these few devotional thoughts. It was determined that we'll rebuild the building. You know, the load-supporting walls, they're still sound, and the foundation is true. It's just the outside of the building, that exterior, that needs to be replaced. And this time, not with plaster, but with limestone. Block by block, stone by stone, section by section, the old decaying temporary was pulled off and replaced with the new and stable and the beautiful, and the building was restored, rebuilt, refurbished, and saved from utter destruction. And today, you can go to Chicago, and you can see the magnificent job that the artisans completed, and the columns, and the Greek statues, and all of that which had crumbled and was destroyed has been replaced this time in a permanent hard limestone block. And today, what a beautiful building it is. And if you go to Chicago, the Museum of Science and Industry, there you'll see the restored and magnificent Palace of the Fine Arts. But now then, here's the point. And here's what we really want to emphasize for these few thoughts together. You know, here lately I've been working with Paul's words to the saints in Corinth and particularly a couple of chapters. If the world gets back to normal here in a few months, I'm scheduled to be on one program, bring a couple of lessons from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15. What a great study that is, the resurrection of the dead and how important, essential, core that is to our Christian faith. And you know, there were people in Corinth with their Greek, their Hellenistic, their secular, worldly, material background, had a hard time understanding. We've buried folks, they thought, and we've seen them perish, and their bodies have been burned, and their bodies are no longer in this world. They have decayed and corrupted and returned to the dust. How in the world it makes no earthly sense that there can be a restoration, a resurrection, a reviving of a body that has completely corrupted and decayed and is now no longer. And that's the backdrop. That's the urgency of the question there in verse 35. How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Well, I'm convinced that no one can improve on an illustration that's inspired by God's own spirit. And that's what Paul relays here in 1 Corinthians 15. You take a seed and you put it into the ground. And for all practical intents and purposes, that seed is gone. But what comes up from the ground, it's that seed, but it's different. It's better. It's changed. And so the apostle will declare, we are sown, buried in the ground, you might say. A natural body, what comes forth is a supernatural body. And one is material and fleshly and temporary, and the other is glorious and celestial and heavenly. That's the best illustration of all. 
But you know, thinking about that restored building, that palace of fine arts, I think that might be another illustration. No, not quite as good, but it's one that you may find appealing. I know that I do. There's the old, beautiful, classic, stately, dignified, refined building that crumbles, becomes worthless, an eyesore, and ready to be knocked down and forgotten forever. And then, block by block, brick by brick, it's rebuilt with better material, finer material, long-lasting material. And if you and I can understand the illustration of a seed being planted in the ground, and from an acorn, a mighty oak may grow. And if you and I can, perhaps one of these days, Walk by and see today's Chicago Museum of Science and Technology and understand the history and the remaking of that building. You and I, surely we don't question the power of God if mortal men can do that for a building. What can Almighty God do for our bodies. And so Paul says, therefore, in Jesus we have this victory, and it's a victory over death and the grave.